of masonry, 5793. At least that's what the newspapers called it when George Washington consecrated the foundation stone of the United States of America, beginning the Masonic rites, including consecrating prayers and corn, wine, and oil in the foundation stone of the United States. Is the United States of America a Masonic nation? Today on 1 Peter 5. Jesus is King. Welcome to the 1 Peter 5 podcast, Rebuilding Christendom, Restoring Catholic Culture and Tradition. I'm Timothy Flanders, the editor-in-chief of 1 Peter 5. Today, we're going to talk about the United States of America. Happy 4th of July to all of our readers who are citizens of these United States. I myself am a Michigander. I'm very thankful for being a Michigander and being part of the United States. It's a wonderful country, but there's a lot of important questions we need to ask about the founding of the United States. Because, as Pope Benedict said, the whole Vatican II experiment is very much based on the fact that churchmen, he says, began to argue that the American Revolution gave us a modern of a secular state that was not neutral regarding values. This is from his Christmas address of 2005, the servant famous hermeneutic of continuity speech. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the founding of the United States and delve deeper into these things. Before we get into that, I want to encourage everybody to please donate to 1 Peter 5. We do depend on your support. We are a nonprofit organization and we are in need of monthly donors for you can donate anything you can you can manage $5 a month, $10 a month, 15 Anything you can manage to help us would be greatly appreciated because we cannot continue this indefinitely without this rebuilding this donor base. So we do need the donor base to be rebuilt. So that is our effort. If you've benefited from this, it is offered free to all, but we ask you to please donate in some way. So please donate to us. You can go to onepeter5.com slash donate. Again, monthly donors are most helpful to us. Um, we did not raise enough out of our spring fundraiser to lack uh, nothing as we go into the rest of the year. So we're still uh, making it up with with crisis publications and allocating money, but we still need to re rebuild that donor base. So please support us, onepeterdive.com slash donate. So we've published a few different articles at 1 Peter 5 over the weekend discussing some of these aspects. And so I want to talk about the first, we had this uh, poll. Let me pull up the poll here uh, on Twitter where everyone could comment on the different aspects of the American Revolution. Now, the reason I did this poll was because there was another similar poll that uh, an author released a while back. Let me pull it up on the screen, if I can, on this browser. Let's see if this works. Um log out. So the, the final tally was 1,100 votes. And this came up to 59% um, believe that this the American Revolution was a Masonic creation. Here, let me bring the um, let me try this a different way. One Peter. Okay, this should work. Let's see if this works. Okay, great. All right. So let me zoom in a little bit here. So here's the, here's the final tally right now as it stands. The American Revolution was crypto-Catholic, 11% voted that. Uh, Masonic, 59% voted that. Pure John Locke, 16% voted that. Other says 13%. Um, I want to highlight uh, my buddy Trevor Acorn, Elkhorn, who says, it is not as cut and dry as some would like it to be. It makes... It makes it much more difficult to talk about nice and succinctly. It was a combination of the factors listed. I want to, I want to uh, agree with that uh, from Trevor. Thank you, uh, Trevor. Yeah, I think it is true that there really are all these different elements and more in the American Revolution. The American Revolution is a complex historical event, which is very much turned into an ideology. Uh, the reason that. I put this poll out there is because there was a there was an author, Catholic author, a number of years ago who was forwarding a very 
positive view about the American Revolution. And this is really the view from that um, Jacques Maritain brings out in his reflections on America. This is in the 1950s. Why is it that Pope Benedict mentions the American Revolution? So let me first provide some context for his, co his, his comments on, in this area where he discusses the Vatican II project. Well, the Vatican II project is very much a post-war council. That's the way that we need to understand Vatican II very much. It's a post-war council. It's defined by the era that really was from 1945 until about 1965, 1968. That's when that era pretty much ended with the first, the second sexual revolution that, that occurred. And what defined that era? Well, the dominance of the American empire as a positive force because America, the Western Europe had just been liberated from Nazism by the American Empire. And the American Empire had been pushing against the atheistic communism. It had declared some kind of holy crusade against communism. Think about it in the 1950s. We have the greatest, the greatest American commentator is really Fulton Sheen. We have Hollywood producing Catholic films in the 1950s. They're exporting them around the world. In the 1950s, it was easy for people to think that the United States really was this positive force. And maybe the church could throw in her lot with the United States as a positive force in the world. Let me see if I can grab this quote from Jacques Maritain. Uh, you know, here, let me search for it a second. So I, I, I'm not sure if Ratzinger is referring to Jacques Maritain in particular, but he definitely... Jacques Maritain is definitely one of the biggest thinkers at this time when he speaks about the American Revolution in such a positive way. So this is a quote from Jacques Maritain, Reflections on America. This is from 1956. Jacques Maritain, quote, The formidable adventure begun in this country with the Pilgrim Fathers and the Pioneers and continued in the great days of the Declaration of Independence and the Revolutionary War it will be necessary for the European spirit and the American spirit to meet and cooperate in common goodwill. If we want civilization to survive a world of free men penetrated in its secular substance by a real and vital Christianity, a world in which the inspiration of the gospel will direct the common life of man toward a heroic humanism. It is possible to be more specific. What the world expects from America is that she may keep alive in human history a fraternal recognition of the dignity of man. In other words, the terrestrial hope of men in the gospel. End quote. So this is the sort of a very positive view that Jacques Maritain gets out of coming to America. Now, in context, we got to remember Jacques Maritain comes from a very politically, socially, religiously divided France. He, he leaves France that had just been uh, very much divided. There was the Dreyfus affair. Jacques Maritain is married to a Jew. Um, and we have he comes to America and he sees this great cooperation, this great sort of pluralism that's very civil in the United States. We have the rise during this period of the Catholic Church as this great social force. The Catholic Church boycotts the pornography in Hollywood, shuts it out. And then we have this rise of American Catholicism in the 1950s. So Jacques Maritain, I, I, you know, you can kind of understand why he would might think that. Why people might think that there's such a positive force, because there was such a positive force at this time. And so it, it there's a certain sense to the fact that the church could, some churchmen could think that we could throw in our lot with the United States at this time. Because it was very much a positive force in many ways. And so this is what helps us to understand why, why is it so important that we look at the American Revolution? So... We just had Jacques Maritain quoting that, you know, the basic kind of mythology of the Declaration of Independence is such as, you know, this great document of freedom. And so let's go into that a little bit. So I quoted our, when we first began, this is a um, the, the year of masonry, 5793. That is what the newspapers reported when George Washington conducted the Masonic rites to, to commemorate this, uh, this event. Now here's, let me pull this up. Here's an article. I'm going to, I'll put this in the live chat right now. 
here's the here's the article that I'm drawing from here, but this is from a, a, actually a government website. So if we pull this up, here's George Washington, the first cornerstone. So this is the architect of the of the Capitol. So this is on uh, AOS uh, architect of the Capitol dot gov, the first cornerstone, which was laid on 1793, but it was reported as the year of masonry, 5793. Now, keep in mind, the year of masonry is also called the year of light, meaning the meaning Lucifer, the light bearer, the enlightenment and all this. So here's the depiction of of George Washington conducting the Masonic rites. You got the little Masonic uh, apron here thing here. Uh, we've got a, a Protestant minister being a part of this. Here's George Washington. And then they and then the report in the newspaper. And this is from if anyone cares to look it up. The actual primary source for this is from the uh, Columbia Mirror and the Alexandria Gazette from September 25, 1793. And it also has a let's see if it has the photo here, but this is also commemorated on this bronze arch. See, they found the, the cornerstone. Uh, or they were looking for it, I guess. I couldn't find the... Um, I was looking for the... There's actually a bronze... Here we go. Senate bronze door. Here it is. So this is also commemorated on the Senate bronze doors. So here it is. Um, George Washington laying the cornerstone with this Masonic ritual. So I think that it is safe to say that there's a Masonic element in the American Revolution. I, I cannot agree with some who deny all Masonic cooperation. Now, as uh, Kennedy Hall pointed out in his article, we already know that the British Empire was already Masonic. So we just have another, we have Masons rebelling against Masons, in a sense. But can we say that George Washington was pushing forward further Masonry with their new revolution? Yes, I think we can. Have we ever had a have had a country that had a cornerstone dedicated with Masonic rituals? Now, what's interesting here is that at the same time we have the Carroll family. We have this situation where we have George Washington as and Leo the Third. Somebody asked in the in the beginning of. Uh, if there are any church documents, well, there's two church documents that directly deal with America by Leo the 13th. There's uh Longiqua Oceani. I think that's the right Latin. Um, let me look that up real quick, but there's Testem Bene Benevolentiae. That's the, that's the main one. And Longiqua is the one which speaks of Washington as the noble Washington and a well-ordered Republic. And the Carroll family was the greatest Catholic, really the, this great rich family. This was uh, the Carroll family, members of the Carroll family signed the Declaration of Independence and also signed the U.S. Constitution. Bishop John Carroll was the first bishop of the United States. He's the one who consecrated the United States to the Immaculate Conception in 1789. And so we owe Catholicism in the United States very much to the Carroll family. And what's interesting is that the Carroll family sided with the Patriots. And we can understand why they might side with them, because the, the Catholic colony of Maryland, which was founded by English Catholic refugees, the Lords Baltimore, there's Lord Baltimore one, Lord Baltimore two, they founded it as a refuge for Catholics because they were fleeing the Elizabethan and later King, King's, uh, Anglican King's persecution they found it as a refuge for Catholics where Catholics could be free to have the Holy Mass publicly. And, but they gave civil rights actually to other Christians. They allowed others to have the freedom of religion in Maryland. Uh, it, apparently the Lord Baltimore who founded the colony did not want to create a, a Christendom in Maryland and have the, the normal setup that we might have as Catholics, but he wanted to create this sort of proto pluralism this proto religious freedom and this is what james gibbons says in his book faith of our fathers later in the 19th century he claims that the origins of the this religious pluralism of the united states really happened in catholic maryland and to a degree he's right there is a certain aspect of that but 
what happened was during the so-called glorious revolution, the ugly revolution of 1688, and even before that with the English Civil War, the heretical Puritans took over the colony of Maryland and forced out the Catholics from having freedom, the freedom that they had founded with their own colony. They could no longer have the freedom. They couldn't have civil rights. They couldn't serve in government anymore. But because the Carroll family was so rich, they did practice slavery, etc. They continued to have their land, so they had private chapels, but they didn't, they couldn't, they were forced out of government. So at the time of the American Revolution, the Carroll family supports the Patriots, and they it seems that they were influenced by the Enlightenment ideas, but we can see that they were also trying to just regain their rights, regain their rights that they originally had with the founding of Catholic Maryland. And to his credit, George Washington supported the Carroll family and allowed them to have political power once again. So the, the Catholics of Maryland actually gained out of the, the American Revolution. They gained more influence in society. They donated some of the plot of land. The In fact, one of the Carroll family was part of that Masonic ritual. The Catholic Daniel Carroll and his his name is listed as commissioner on the Masonic silver plate. And he's the one who had signed the, the U S constitution earlier in 1789. So we have the Carroll family being intimately involved in the Patriot cause. Now the, the other English or Irish Catholics who were just sort of the rank and file, not the elite, like the Carrolls, uh, many of them supported the loyalist cause. And this is the reality of the American Revolution was that it was a civil war between the Patriot colonists and the Loyalist colonists. And another as another great chunk of them just refused to fight. So it was a civil war. Now, let me before I comment on the other Catholic powers, we need to realize that the Patriots used anti-Catholicism to forward their cause. One of the biggest things about the American Revolution that prompted it was that King George III, who was recognized as le the legitimate king by the Pope after the Pope had previously deposed the Elizabethan crown back in the 1500s, the Continental Congress condemned King George III because of the Quebec Act. The Quebec Act, uh, which was an act of parliament, established freedom of religion for Catholics in Quebec. So the Quebec City, the French Catholicism in Canada, had been acquired after the Seven Years' War by the British Crown. And King George III, instead of enforcing the laws that were in England against Catholicism, he decided with the, with the English, the British Crown and the Parliament, decided to pass the Quebec Act, which allowed Catholicism to continue, not only to continue privately, but to be established as the public religion of Quebec. Now, here's what the Continental Congress said in 1774. Quote, this is condemning Parliament. For, quote, the establishing the Roman Catholic religion in the province of Quebec, abolishing the equitable system of English laws and erecting a tyranny there, end quote. So for the Continental Congress, there is this hatred for the Quebec Act because it allowed Catholicism to continue. And they they call that tyranny. They tell they call Catholicism per se tyranny. Now notice what happens in the Declaration of Independence. This is a quotation. Now here's a quotation from the Declaration of Independence, which is condemning the Quebec Act. And notice what it says. He's it's King George the third is condemned for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, i.e. Quebec establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. Now notice the, the buzzwords here. We've got arbitrary government, i.e. tyranny, and we've got absolute rule into these colonies. So it's basically condemning the fact that they're allowing Catholicism in Quebec and they're they're saying that he's going to establish that into the colonies as well. We're going to establish this tyranny of Catholicism in the colonies. And that's in the Declaration, Declaration of Independence. 
So we have an anti-Catholic clause in the very Declaration of Independence. Now, does Jacques Maritain really understand what he was saying when he said, praising the Declaration of Independence, when it had this anti-Catholic clause that condemns Christendom as this arbitrary government? Well, that's a serious issue. We have anti-Catholicism in the very founding documents that today, this is the day that we celebrate the Declaration of Independence. So we have a serious problem with this, and it's just not that simple. As uh, as Trevor Elkhorn said, there's a lot of different factors. There is this masonry. There is this anti-Catholicism. Now, I want to talk about the crypto-Catholic idea. And this is something that we published between Ryan Grant, Timothy Gordon, others. Ryan Grant makes mention of other historic Catholics who have claimed that the uh, ca- the principles of the founding were Catholic, basically. So the... The difficulty is that back during the act of supremacy of parliament, back under King Henry VIII and later under Elizabeth I, you had two different powers, the parliament and the and the crown, agreeing on one thing, and that is not Rome. That's what they agreed on. But then, because after you have not Rome, well, then both of those sought absolute power absolute tyranny so you had the the crown the king sought absolute power and that helped to develop the idea of the divine right of kings or absolutism which is an abuse of monarchy it's a a devolving monarchy into tyranny because a monarch is not absolute because only god is absolute the king himself is crowned to defend the rights of the people and the law of god Now, the parliament is also not absolute, of course, for the same reason. But you had these different factions in English history in the 1600s, which were fighting with each other. So we have the absolutists who are forwarding the idea of the divine right of kings, the absolute monarchs. And then we have the parliamentarians. Now, the parliamentarians did see, because what happened was Robert Filmer wrote Patriarcha, and uh, King King Charles and K- the uh, dynasties coming into the 1600s were forwarding this idea of the divine right of kings. And this was critiqued by, say, Robert Bellarmine and the Catholics, who denied that the king had absolute power. So they were critiquing this tyranny, but they were coming back to the Catholic position, and the Catholic position being not that the king has the absolute power and not that the parliament has absolute power but the that the there is a freedom and a consent of the people in a sense but not in a sense that the people creates the authority but what happened was there were two heretical notions of political power there was the absolute monarchs and then the parliamentarians or the sort of absolute republics neither of these are fully Catholic, but both of them borrow some Catholic elements because they're both heretical notions trying to work on their own way to fight against the other faction. The Catholic notion is always the Catholic notion is always the whole integrated through the different parts. And that heresies always uh, term heresy simply means a choice, a choice between two truths. It's a half truth, basically. So Absolute monarchy is a half truth. And so an absolute republicanism is also a half truth. So what happened was there is you you do have Bellarmine and other Catholic thinkers who are critiquing both of these, trying to forward the Catholic notions, which do does have a limited government aspect to it. So I I think there is I think we we can concede to Mr. Gordon that there is a there is a crypto Catholic nature to the American Revolution. The difficulty is that it is a conservative anti-Catholic revolution, which does have certain Catholic elements. Like we like we said, we have the Carroll family gaining more civil rights as Catholics as a result of the revolution. But at the same time, there is also this anti-Catholic aspect. And we have Catholicism condemned in the very Declaration of Independence. So if insofar as the Declaration of Independence is condemning absolute monarchy, 
that is a Catholic notion to condemn absolute monarchy because absolute monarchy is tyranny. But at the same time, insofar as this is merely forwarding the concepts of masonry and the concepts of John Locke, it's not. It is not a Catholic notion. So John Locke comes in. Now, we, we what we have to remember is this, what happens in 1688 with the ugly revolution, the so-called glorious revolution. Excuse me. Um, what happens in 1688 is that we have the Catholic King James II. He's a Catholic King of England, the first Catholic King since actually his, his father converted to Catholicism on his deathbed. But we have the Catholic King James II, and all the heretics want to push him out. And so they push him out, and they bring in King William of Orange, in 1688, this is the what historians call the Glorious Revolution, but what, what Catholics need to start calling the Ugly Revolution, because they push out King William, and then John Locke writes this, his second treatise on government. This is the one that uses all the same phrases as the Declaration of Independence, and it justifies, it justifies the revolution in 1688. and says, we had the right to push out Catholic King James II because he was going to impose an arbitrary government, i.e. a Catholic government. Now, it is true that King James II was also not a very good ruler as well. And some of these Catholic powers, including the King of France, wanted to really do this tyranny. They wanted to do this absolute tyranny as Catholics. And that's a problem because then discredits Catholicism and actually does create it into an arbitrary government. But what John Locke says in his second treatise of government, he justifies this revolution, this revolutionary character. Now, is there a sense of Catholics revolting in some sense? Is there a, a Catholic tyrannicide? I think that the, the sources do indicate there is something of that. I think it's a little bit, a lot more shaky than the John Locke version, however, because John Locke's version is the, the power comes from the people. It's directly from the people. So the people can just revolt and take away the ruler willy nilly, basically. Um, and so, but what we need to see here is that this whole history leading up to 1776 is colored by this legacy of the so-called glorious revolution and John Locke's justification thereof. In 1745, when George Washington was 13 years old, there was the latest Jacobite uprising. The Jacobite legacy were the Catholic kings of England, descended from King James II, trying to retake the throne. So there's always this threat that the Catholics were going to take over again. And that's how George Washington grows up. Thomas Jefferson grows up with this legacy, this legacy of we need to keep this republic here to maintain the anti-Catholic status quo. And when you have King George III allowing Catholicism in, in Quebec, we have a what looks to be a, a serious reversal. We need, we need to maintain this anti-Catholic status quo. And so the, the king is beginning to assert more and more power, which they're using in the, in the Declaration of Independence to assert that the arbitrary power is coming, this, this absolute monarchy is coming again. He's going to impose Catholicism on us. And so we are fighting against him to maintain the anti-Catholic status quo. So it's a, it's a conservative revolution. It's trying to preserve things as they are. And that's what makes it somewhat traditional in a sense. Also, and I think we can concede this as well to Mr. Timothy Gordon. There is also the defense of subsidiarity. I think this is this is a very, very good point because the founding of America, despite the fact that despite all these issues, there is a very virulent defense of the Catholic principle of subsidiarity, that the colonies are their own states and they govern themselves and they reject greater government over themselves. They reject greater control over themselves they want the self-government of their own states. And this is the legacy, which still we still see today with as the COVID nightmare went through and all the different 
Marxist governments asserted more and more power. We saw this. I mean, President Trump put the COVID implementation back to the governors of each state. That was really an act of subsidiarity. The United States, along with uh, Great Britain and other such countries, if, if they have the same legacy, were able to break free and avoid a lot of the COVID tyranny. So this is a great thing. This is something we should be thankful for. If, if you're a citizen of one of these United States, we should be thankful for this. It's something that we, we can definitely be grateful for. It, it, unfortunately, like our brethren in Canada are suffering under a great Marxist power. And unfortunately, that's the case in many European countries, which with an immense amount of tyranny, imposing various things regarding COVID and all of those things. I probably shouldn't even be saying these words. We'll see if this YouTube video gets flagged. But um, so we should be thankful on the 4th of July for these things. And this is this Catholic principle of subsidiarity is very, very grave, as uh, Gordon brings out in his article, certainly. Uh, so there's definitely a factor, definitely aspects of the crypto Catholicism. There's aspects of Masonry. There's aspects, obviously, of John Locke, very large influence. And these are different factors, different, different things that make up the complexity of the American Revolution. But what we don't what we shouldn't do is we shouldn't make it into an ideology, because I think that this is where we come in as trads and we say, Yes, we can concede certain things and we can celebrate certain things as Leo XIII did even in uh, Longiqua in 1895. We can celebrate certain things. We can be thankful for the, the quote unquote noble Washington as Leo XIII called him. We can be thankful that he gave the Carroll family the civil rights. They were able to build churches again. We, we have these ancient churches because of the American Revolution. We've got the Catholics gained more rights. That was that was a, certainly a blessing from God that more churches were able to be built for the glory of God. And we can be thankful for these aspects of the American Revolution that some of them were positive in terms of the subsidiarity. But we also need to take a look at this and say, on Catholic principles, was this a just war? Can you revolt against your sovereign because you're paying too much too many taxes? What if people did that today? The taxes we have now, the amount of revolt, the amount of revolt that went on to to uh, you know fight and and shed blood because you were paying too much too many taxes. Uh, and ironically, after the U.S. Constitution came into force, the federal government started taxing the states in like manner or perhaps worse than King George was doing. And the power of the federal government has just increased, unfortunately. But the point is, is that we cannot look at the American Revolution with an ideological lens. We need to see the complexity of the situation. We should not simplify it. I think that Jacques Maritain was a little naive. Unfortunately, I think people were a little naive in the 1960s with Vatican II when people were speaking about the United States in these flowery terms. And they did not consider that the church's enemies were right at the door, even in the United States, to impose Marxism, to impose feminism and the sexual revolution, the second one in the later 1960s. So I think ultimately we need to realize that this post-war council of Vatican II, this post-war council, the era of this post-war council is at an end. It's been done since 1970 at the at the latest. It's over. That era, perhaps, perhaps the the perhaps the you know if if there would have been a lot shrewder churchmen, maybe we could have done something. Maybe there, I I think that there was sort of this Constantine moment, but when John F. Kennedy renounced his Catholicism in order to gain the power of the presidency in the 19 in 1960, I think it was all over at that point, and so. By the time Vatican II starts and they try to, the churchmen, many churchmen of Western Europe and the United States try to throw in their lot with this American experiment, it's already going downhill very rapidly. We have the Legion of Decency, which had kept out pornography for decades at that point. Pornography is finally imposed on the United States during Vatican II. 
during Vatican II. That was when that happened. I can't remember if it was 1964 or 65, but it was during Vatican II when this actually, this is broken. And it also happened at the same time in Germany during Vatican II. So right as the bishops were hoping that the American experiment would really bring about this change, we have pornography coming in. And then the unborn Holocaust in 1973 gets imposed in the United States and elsewhere. The this this post-war era this post-war optimism about the united states there was optimism it, it was real but it's over now it's over now now we are fighting an uphill battle and we've just gained our first victory to fight against this but we need to go back to one of the good things about this american finding which is the localism the subsidiarity we need to fight for christendom in our local area in our family in our community in our city in our state and that's what this new opportunity has brought us back to what we know now is that the modern world does not want dialogue vatican ii held out this branch of medicine of mercy of dialogue to the modern world and the modern world rejected it and imposed the unborn holocaust and we've been fighting ever since. And as long as churchmen continue to think that the post-war experiment of Vatican II is continuing to be really truly responding to the signs of the times, we're going to be locked in this optimism, which is outdated. So that's why the American Revolution, we just see this for what it is. Look at the aspects of the American Revolt, which we can take but push forward for something truly Catholic, which can last, which can protect the unborn and continue on for the sake of Christ and the gospel. So that is all we have today. So once again, thank you for watching. Please donate to our cause, onepeter5.com slash donate. Happy 4th of July. It's great to celebrate all of our states and this country and the good things here and the flourishing of the church here over 200 years. And we pray for many more years and blessings, but especially for this fight that we undertake for the sake of the unborn. So let's, let's have an Ave Maria and let's close out. I, I'm going to get my Our Lady of Fatima icon. This is the Russian Catholic icon that we've been promoting at one Peter five. So I encourage you to pray, pray with us and let's celebrate God's blessings. Let's offer gratitude for God's mercy that has been poured out with the Dobbs decision, the mercy for protecting the unborn children. And we pray that our lady of the immaculate conception, the patroness of the United States will bless America. In nomine Patris, et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus Tecum. Benedicta tu mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tu, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. Blessed Emperor Carl, pray for us. In nomine Patris, et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Jesus is